So welcome this morning to our service, Dreams Beneath the Snow. We begin with the opening song, I Seek the Spirit of a Child, played by our choir director, Rebecca Patterson. I seek the spirit of a child, a child who meets life naturally, a child who sings the world alive and greets the morning sun with glee. Children are real beyond all arms. They I see joys a gift to our heart. I seek the freedom of a child, a child who loves instinctively, who lights our day with just a smile and shines that light on all we see. Children are real beyond our fears. May I see hopes a gift to our tears. I seek the wonder of a child, a child who sees delightfully the clouds in cloud, the golden sun, imaginations true and free. Children are real beyond all lies. May I see. Good morning. As we begin, we pause to remember that the land where Westwood was founded, Amiskwatch was Kethen, or Beaver Hills House, has borne witness to thousands of years of Indigenous history, culture, and spirituality, and continues to do so, which provides a rich and fertile context for us as we gather here in our virtual but very real community. For this, we are grateful and we strive to educate ourselves on how to be better at living our values together. Welcome to Westwood Unitarian Congregation. My name is Lorian Kennedy and I'm your service leader this morning. I bid a special welcome to those who have found us for the first time and those who consider themselves newcomers. We're glad you're here. We look forward to sharing our community online and eventually in person with you. We hope you'll stay for the informal conversation groups after the service. Please do ask questions, check out our website and sign up with your email address to get timely information about our online events and come to any events that interest you. Our Zoom links are always in our online calendar. Our theme for January of this brand new year 2021 is vulnerability. Who could have ever predicted just how deeply meaningful that word would be? We're all feeling it for ourselves and for others. It helps to be together in community. Today, Reverend Ann Barker will be speaking about dreams beneath the snow. Also a huge thanks to our musician, Rebecca Patterson and Alara Stephanie Godet and Bill Lee, who are providing tech support. Hello, I'm Ann Barker. I use she, her pronouns. And I wanna speak just a moment before the chalice lighting about ritual spaces. One of the things we do uh, in our online services is we invite people to have a candle or a chalice that you bring forward. And so I always bring mine forward now for the chalice lighting time. And because we're not in the same room together, if you have a candle or a chalice at home, it helps us to be doing something in unison. It's certainly not necessary, but uh, sometimes people find it meaningful. I was preparing this weekend for this service and thinking about, I always try to make my backdrop new each month. And I realized that 
you know, in the upstairs and the outside of our house, what is really important to us is that all those festive lights stay on, that we're not taking down solstice or taking down Christmas. We are holding those lights um, as reassurance and comfort and as a gift or maybe an annoyance to our neighbors. But I noticed that many of them also still have their lights on too. So all the little sparkly lights I added for winter solstice and the candles I've been burning on the second shelf, they're going to stay up. And uh, January will not be a time of darkness. It will still be a time of tenderness and celebration. So now our chalice lighting words. Because I hate resolutions, I make promises of imagination, making manifest the little dreams buried this year and bigger hopes crushed by a thousand little cuts by the sweeping tidal waves of 2020 and also promises to hold on to the lessons lingering in the muck and beauty of it all. I promise to get outside every day, to drink in the cool air and look up at the sky to hug trees and smell flowers and to bring more green inside. I promise to water those plants too. I promise to stay slow, to sit and stare, to take more naps, to say no and yes more often. I promise to love more freely, to keep cooking and making bread. I promise to say thank you for the little things and big things every day. I promise not to get too comfortable or too righteous to let in enough pain to stay fired up, committed to the dream of belovedness, the dream of the emerging world where our liberation is bound up with everyone and everything, always beckoning us to see more clearly and love more deeply. I promise to let the fires burn away the old crusty obstacles and excuses and make space for new dreams for all that imagination can conjure, to notice the light and let it shine to fan the flames of hope and cleanse the spirit and let life begin again, renewed, gentle, following the sparks into the next unknown. Come, let us worship together. These are the words of the Reverend Sarah Lawal. We light our chalices this morning in the spirit of gentle renewal. As part of our sharing with each other in community, we invite you now to light your candles virtually by chat, typing into the chat any of your concerns or your joys that you wish to share with each of us. So please do that now in the chat.
I light one final candle for all those joys and concerns that remain in our hearts. Would you join with me now with, while remaining muted to read the affirmation? May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Along with so many things that have changed in the past months, our offertory time is now virtual. But again, virtual still means real. This is an opportunity to put our energy and resources into supporting things that are worthwhile and that we believe in. Westwood's offering a wide variety of ways for us to still connect and be supportive and have some fun together too. And we need your financial support to keep doing this. The slide some shows some ways you can contribute and you can always find this information on our website. One of our stimulating events is our Free Thinkers Book Club. Here's Terry Anderson to tell you about it. Hi, my name is Terry Anderson and I'm a member of the Westwood Unitarian Congregation. Today I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Freethinker program we have at Westwood. You may think right off the bat that if you're a thinking Canadian and especially one who's interested in Unitarian ideas, that you are by definition a Freethinker. But the word has a much longer historical meaning than that. Uh, in the 17th, 18th, and even the 19th century, it was politically and maybe even physically dangerous to identify yourself as an atheist or an agnostic or even a humanist. And so those people who wanted to uh, enjoy the benefits of a religious community, but really didn't buy the idea of superstitions and interfering gods, uh, were completely left out. So Unitarians have, have tried to make it so that we not only welcome and accept atheists and agnostics and humanists, but with, that we affirm their right to be in our community uh, despite their creedal beliefs or lack of creedal beliefs. So at Westwood, we, we became the first Canadian congregation to be accepted as a freethinker congregation. And that means that we've been educating ourselves, we've been looking at our language and looking at our outreach programs. And one of the prime ways that we do that is through the Freethinker Book Club. Uh, we meet once a month, either face-to-face -face or online, and we discuss uh, books that we choose at the beginning of each year. And these books are they're generally serious books. They're, they, we went through the New Atheists and then we've been on to moral and some religious, some anti-religious and some philosophical books. And we've even dabbled in fiction books. Uh, generally, we have a, an hour and a half roundtable discussion and we welcome the insights, we welcome the community and we welcome the chance to get to know each other. So if you're at all interested in Freethinkers or in Westwood Unitarian, I would urge you to go to our website. It's westwoodunitarian.ca and type, type in Freethinker and you'll see the list of the books that we've talked about. You'll see the links that you can join us on the last Wednesday of every month. And we really look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. We now invite you to sing along with Rebecca for our offertory song. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. The new year feels like a great gift of time, the expanse of the year opening before us. In reality, the true gift is each moment. May we welcome this new year, cultivating a mindfulness to the gift and calling of each moment.
Buddhist teacher Stephanie Noble writes, dark is the rich fertile earth that cradles the seed nourishing growth. Dark is the soft night that cradles us to rest. Only in darkness can stars shine across the vastness of space. There is a mystery woven in the dark quiet hours. There is magic in the darkness. We are born of this magic. January 17th is known as Ditch Your New Year's Resolutions Day. The day where, if you have not already, most people abandon the ideas that they boldly committed to at the start of the new year. In our opening reading, Sarah Lawall offers an alternative to those grand gestures. Instead, she makes promises of imagination promises to hold on to the lessons of the previous year, even if that means lingering in the muck and beauty of it all. And to do small things like get outside more, not get too righteous or too comfortable. Here are her words again. I promise to let the fires burn away the old crusty obstacles and excuses and make space for new dreams for all that imagination can conjure, to notice the light and let it shine, to fan the flames of hope and cleanse the spirit and let life begin again, renewed, gentle, following the sparks into the next unknown. I don't know about you, what you do at this time of year We've never actually shared this particular service together. This is the first time in 13 years. For many years, Mitch Walden has offered a service entitled Ba Humbug on the first Sunday of January. And if there was ever a humbug year, this is surely it. But last year, he decided that this offering had run its course and he was ready to let go. I know that you wrote messages and left them in a silver tin. I'm not sure what kind of messages they were. I'm pretty sure that Mitch, like Sarah in the reading before, thought that resolutions were humbug. So maybe someone could type into the chat right now, if you're a person who came to the humbug service, what was the kind of message, not the message you wrote, but what kind of messages did you write on those scraps of paper in this first Sunday in January? What was their point or purpose or theme? If you came this morning for the comfort or the familiarity of that particular service, I'm sorry for any loss that you're experiencing. I do know that that silver tin, like so many other Westwood treasures, is safely tucked away inside our building, staying warm and dry and awaiting our return. The other thing I don't know is if from year to year, people retrieved their messages, or if you collectively burned them the next year, or what happened. So I see somebody has written into the chat for us, letting go of past regrets and embracing hope. What a beautiful idea. Oh, and here we go. There were two scraps of paper. We wrote something to let go of in the new year on one, and those were buried and the ones in the silver tin were intentions for the new year. So if you would like, you're welcome to share those kinds of messages in the chat if that speaks to you, but that's a more public thing than writing them on a piece of paper, but just so that if that ritual is important to you, you are welcome. Ah, there's the information I'm looking for. The silver tin ones were returned to people in the following year's service. When we return to the building, and there will be a time when we return to the building, we will honor your tradition as a piece of our returning ritual. They are not lost. 
they are waiting. Have you thought about that event, our returning ritual? I think about it all the time. How will we mark the moment when it's safe to be together again? It won't likely be one specific moment where safety is achieved, but there will be a symbolic moment where it is celebrated. Symbols are important. You might wonder, why is she talking about this now in January when it seems so far away from the conditions that mean that we will gather in close proximity again? But that's exactly why. Because we are still far away. This is the work of winter, the season of renewal, not the bright spring bursts of color and birdsong, but the slow, quiet work of imagination. The preliminary design of the dreams yet to come. It looks like the world is doing nothing, but inside, inside homes and caves and barns and factories, inside mines and journals and gardens and dreams, there are seeds waiting to germinate. Seeds deep beneath the snow or in paper bags in your garage or that tin box in the basement or within your imagination. This is the season not so much of planting seeds unless you're starting strawberries inside apparently. Now is time to start strawberry plants. I think that's beyond me. This is the season of planning seeds. Now is the time in our northern climate when you sketch the garden, not plow it. Right now, the bugs and the bacteria, they nestle beneath the snow like promises, waiting to do their work, to transform the environment in ways that only they can do. This is when we order our new seeds or organize our collected or saved seeds and plan how we will arrange them in the spaces that we have available. This is the time when we might discover that our dreams are bigger than our land plot or that our garden is bigger than our energy reserve. When we might reimagine the layout to be more ergonomic or economic or beautiful or practical. Now, when we can't reasonably dig in the garden, can't wisely transplant perennials, can't responsibly spread delicate seeds, now is the time when we reflect, when we imagine, and when we reimagine. I think often about our returning ritual because I need to keep the vision of returning in my heart and in my mind the vision of being together in body as well as in spirit, the celebration of surviving the COVID cycle, the recognition of all that was lost to the isolation and the separation. It's why we have crafting projects going on to make quilt squares that we will only sew together when we can literally sit in the room together and do that. It's why we make yarn squares to join together now to bring comfort to people in the meantime. This pandemic is a long winter. And many of our dreams lay dormant, deep beneath the snow, waiting for the season to turn, waiting for the conditions to be right, waiting for the alchemy of change. So we wait and we plan and we dream and we imagine. And we put our faith in a resolution because we need a resolution. Not the kind of resolutions where we force change, but the kind of resolutions that come when the conditions are right. We can help the conditions, but we can't force them. 
this is more how I like to think about the changeover of the calendar year. It's not a magical number, really, not January 1st and everything is new again and it's all going to be okay. Although I'm pretty sure that most of us are quite relieved to see the end of 2020 and ready for change and looking for a fresh outlook. But 2021 doesn't magically foretell better. It's simply a point, a marker, a focus for our attention. It's so important to have markers and milestones where we strengthen our knowledge of ourselves by reflecting and comparing and saying, this time last year, what? What were you doing? Where were you going? Who did you spend time with? What mattered to you then? What did you write on that little slip of paper that's in the tin box or buried in the garden? We think about simpler New Year's or more complex ones. That year we were halfway around the world or that year when we'd planned to be but didn't get there. We compare ourselves to our own histories not in a contest, but in an inventory, adding another year to our story, another year of learning and growing and changing, another year of discovery. We are a research project learning about ourselves. It doesn't really matter which annual markers we choose, different cultures mark different days. We're a people who notice birthdays and anniversaries, and the turning of the wheel. The new year could be any time, really, whether we recognize January 1st or Chinese New Year that corresponds with Gregorian February this year, or Islamic New Year that will come in what we know as August, or Rosh Hashanah in September, or Sawin in October. What matters is that there are traditions and symbols and markers to plot your remembrance and your recognition and your imagination against. Indigenous ceremony teaches us the importance of remembering, of retelling our stories and of passing down wisdom and tradition. Christian ceremony invites us to mark Christmas and Easter as celebrations of birth and renewal. Pagan ceremony encourage us to find our place on the wheel of life and to be present in nature and therefore become responsible stewards. Rituals and traditions give us the signposts to mark our journey, our progress, yes, but also our effort and our weariness. Our seasons with our celebrations and our lessons and our losses. They remind us to stop, to take heed, Winter is like this, the cold and the ice and the snow. Stop and take heed, pay attention, be careful, be wise. Scott Erickson in the book Honest Advent writes this, wonder is to be found when we move from obsessively figuring out cosmic plans to observing intentionality in the details of where we actually are. Let me read that again. Wonder is to be found when we move from obsessively figuring out cosmic plans to observing intentionality in the details of where we actually are. In my heart, New Year's resolutions are about trying to force the universe into what we believe is the shape of virtue, where we take stock of our shortcomings and insist that we will conquer them in the coming year. And by January 17th, we're likely to be joining the disillusioned and the defeated. And this year we can't even meet at a bar and share a round or three to commiserate. The dominant culture has been to beat ourselves into submission every January 1, then beat ourselves into depression when we fail. If you have escaped this hamster wheel of judgment, then what we need from you is for you to share that wisdom broadly. This is the valuable reflection of New Year's to identify 
where you have grown into self-acceptance and to share those stories with people who are still seeking it. We can't give self-acceptance to someone, but we can model it and we can learn from one another. We need markers to ring the bell. It's time to reflect, to share, to exchange. Religion failed people when it told them that they weren't good enough and that to achieve enlightenment or divinity or forgiveness that they needed to squeeze into some specific shape of virtue. That was a tool of oppression and control and a way of organizing the masses into frightened, faithful sheep. But religion serves people when it tells them they are already good, already valuable, possessing already an inherent worth and dignity. That one, that's one of our purposes in this religious community and the broad ship of Unitarian Universalism to declare that all people, and I would argue all beings, possess an inherent worth and dignity, full stop. We might sometimes need to rearrange ourselves a little. We might want to rearrange ourselves a lot, but before that happens, we are already worthy. We are seeds bundles of energy full of life's potential. And I'm not talking the potential to achieve, but simply the potential to live and hopefully thrive. Sometimes we're seeds in waiting, waiting for a germinating event. Sometimes we're seeds lying fallow, resting. Sometimes we're growing abundantly, sharing fruit or beauty or shelter or hope. Sometimes we're fragile and delicate and in need of tender care to thrive or even to simply survive. And eventually we are all spent. But our beauty is not in what we achieve. It just is. Our value is not in how we perform. It's simply our existence. We are a lesson, a mystery, an experience. Any of these is enough. Wonder is to be found when we move from obsessively figuring out cosmic plans and observing intentionality in the details of where we actually are. When winter settles in and when the new year rolls around, this is a useful time to notice the details. This is the time to see where we actually are, to notice who we actually are, to inventory what we actually need. Do you know that for a jack pine seed to germinate, it must be touched by fire? Its hard resinous shell will not burst open without the powerful heat of an actual flame. Or that in the wild, raspberry and blackberry seeds need to be abraded in a bird's gizzard or eroded by digestive acids before water and air can enter the seed and germination can begin. Many Australian seeds require the presence of smoke, not fire, not the heat of the fire, but the actual chemicals in the smoke to come to life. I think about growing plants as a combination of sunlight and water, right? Isn't that the story we always tell our children in that simple form and you put it in the earth and the sun and the rain and boom, beautiful things. And the rise in temperature tells them that it's time and the right combination of nourishment sustains them. But for many of our local seeds though, in the wild, dormancy is actually broken by a drop in temperature. It's the cold of winter, the season cycle of frost, harsh winds and bitter rains that slowly softens the tough seed coat, rolling it around in the soil, freezing and thawing again, 
until the seed can take up water and actually germinate. Stratification. You can tell a seed needs a cold period if it has a hard bony coat that is impervious to water. Growers can fake or force these conditions and create seeds that don't have to go through this natural cycle or are already put through an alternative so that they've already moved through those steps. But in the wild, plants are wildly, brilliantly varied adapted to their specific biome, making use of or overcoming their specific circumstances. Wonder is to be found when we move from obsessively figuring out cosmic plans to observing intentionality in the details of where we actually are. Where are we actually? What is the intentionality in our surroundings? Now, to be fair, I suspect that Erickson in that quote I keep reading was referring to God's intentionality in this beautiful phrase. And some of you I know will understand it that way. But we're not limited to any one vision, just as our global companions have gone on to discover and to create so many alternative ideas. What is the intentionality in the details of where we actually are? I dream about the garden because I know planting season is coming. I learned from what worked last year and will know more now about how to start tomatoes inside and help them thrive outside. COVID gave me that lesson. Out of a hunger to see positive emerging life, I learned how much I love to nurture tomato babies. And I learned to not start the squash inside. I imagine the ritual for when we are reunited safely in our building because I cannot have that now, but I am certain it will come. I need that certainty, so I feed it. I create it. I can't control the cosmic plans, but I can support the vision. I release myself from the pressure every new year to become a better person. I work on acceptance of who I am. And as I learn new skills and develop deeper character, I like myself a little bit more each year. I'm a seed. I'm still not entirely sure what I will grow into. I am learning to release myself from the desire to obsessively figure out cosmic plans and marvel in the details of where we actually are. Blessed be and amen. So I hope everybody will stay muted and me included, but Sing out. Rebecca's inviting us to come and sing a song with her. So let's do that. Come sing a song with me. Come sing a song with me. Come sing a song with me that I might know your mind. And I'll bring you home.
Extinguishing this morning, if you have a chalice or candle and want to bring it forward and put it out. Our chalice extinguishing is words from Rumi. Rumi is said to have written, don't think the garden loses its ecstasy in winter. It's quiet, but the roots down there are riotous. Let us be quiet and let us be riotous, but let us do it together. And one of the things I see popping up in the chat and I want to just highlight for people is that um, within hours, sometimes, sometimes a few days, our Sunday services go up online. It's been such a blessing to me to be able to attend services that I was maybe speaking somewhere else or taking a day off. And I mean, I think we write the messages we need to hear. So I'll probably listen to this later in the week too, like some of you have mentioned. Um, and maybe even throughout the year, they, they live, the connections and links live on our website and in our YouTube and on our Facebook. So you can listen to them at your leisure whenever you like. We love the joy and magic of babies in a window. And that has been a real joy this morning. I've watched y'all smiling at the baby in Colleen's window. Yay, babies. So thank you for being here. Uh, next week is Speaking Softly, where you'll get to know Goldie a little better. Although I think there's a secret surprise about getting to know Goldie that is not given away in that picture. And one last piece of information. Um, sometimes I see in the chat people asking a question about information. And the best way, because we can't keep up with all the messages in the chat during a service, the best way, if it's a uh, church structure question, is maybe just to send it to info at westwoodunitarian.ca. Info at, Unitarian, at westwoodunitarian.ca can link you to anybody. Um, Elaine's in the office Tuesdays and Fridays, typically. So if you asked a question but didn't get an answer, please follow up that way so that somebody can help you with it because we can't always um, deal with it during the Sunday service when we're trying to build that, that time of connection and, and grace. 